In year nine of school, when we had the school principal talk to us about what career pathways I wanted to take, I said, look, I want to be a professional footballer. And I said, he said, we don't have them in this country, son. And I said, but we might by the time I grow up. <laughs> uh, that was Mr. Woodard. He, he laughed and said, well, look, can you consider another career until that happens? I said, well, I'll take a trade. And, and in the end, I'll become a plumber, you know. So that was pretty good because, you know, some of the, the great Victorians at the time of plumbers, I mean, opening batsman for Australia was Bill Laurie. He was a plumber. The opening bowler was Alan Connolly, and he was a, a plumber. So I thought, oh, plumbing's not bad. This is Legends with Bevo. Thanks to Bet Odyssey, Renelec Electrical Services, and Anytime Fitness Glenelg. And now, here's your host, Bevo. The one and only <laughs> Kevin Sheedy. Welcome to Legends with Bevo. Now, you've got a new book out. It's called The Icons of Sports. We'll get to that a little bit later on, mate. Uh, 929 games as a player and coach. That's a VFL, AFL record. Seven premierships. The man who has done it absolutely all. Great to have you on the show. Uh, welcome, boys. Um, it's great to uh, be chatting to you. Um, I hope everything's going all right over there in the, the great state of South Australia. Yeah, going along quite nicely. But what about over there in Victoria? Starting to uh, get back to a little bit of normality? Well, we're out of that five-day, uh, five-kilometre lockdown, which is good. We've been locked up. Probably uh, not quite two years, but a decent whack of time. <laughs> I can just imagine. You've got enough books there to keep you going for about three years, those sheets. Well, I've written two books in COVID, so I call them my COVID secrets. <laughs> well, we're going to start with our very first segment for today. This one's called Big Failures and What You've Learnt. Now, as I mentioned before, you've had big, an unbelievable, big. unbelievable career. Uh, do you remember the first big fail that you experienced, Sheeds? Uh, how did that make you feel and how did you get past those failures? Failures and, and upsets in your life come at, a, at an expense. They come at uh, sometimes very difficult periods of your life. I mean, I crossed to Richmond and got disqualified for five years for wanting to play VFL. So, and then when I took that risk, I, I did my knee and I missed the 67 Richmond Premiership. So I was out for the year. So that was a failure because I thought I could, would love to have got into that 67 Richmond Premiership side. So uh, th that's a failure from your body point of view, give it up and couldn't get over an injury and an operation quick enough. So, and then um, when I finally got into the Richmond team, um, we won the Premiership and on the Monday I was in the Army for two years of national service. So they're not necessarily failures, but they're sort of are in a way that expectations are high, but... You know, your life changes all of a sudden and, you know, so uh, slight failures in some way, shape or form. Uh, two years in the Army was very good for me. I mean, these days people won't have won't, – the government made you go into the Army. It was a rule by the government. But um, at the moment we can't do two jabs of a needle. So <laughs> <laughs> that's quite amazing. <laughs> so when you see players starting to retire from sport or – you know, uh, Djokovic doesn't want to tell you whether he had two jabs and so forth. Well, I wouldn't have let him in the country. That's it. Out. See you later. You're not coming to the yeah. Australian Open and uh, and you're not playing footy or soccer or rugby or whatever. That's the deal. That's the rules of the nation. Well, the next segment, Sheets, this one's when the going gets tough, the tough gets winning. Now, obviously, as I mentioned before, unbelievable career. 2008, you were named in the AFL Hall of Fame. You were inducted as a legend in 2018. 929 games as a player and coach for 47 years you're involved with footy. What was the first big success you ever felt, though, like back when you were a kid? And how did that make you feel? Do you, do you feel as though it set you on the path to being a professional uh, footballer and coach? Well, in, in um, year nine of school, when we had the school principal talk to us about what career pathways I um, I wanted to take, I said, look, I want to be a professional footballer. And I said, he said, we don't have them in this country, son. And I said, but we might by the time I grow up. <laughs> Uh, that was Mr. Woodard. He, he laughed and said, well, look, can you consider another career until that happens? I said, well, I'll take a trade and, and in the end I'll become a plumber, you know. So that was pretty good because, you know, some of the, the great Victorians at the time of plumbers, I mean, opening batsman for Australia was Bill Laurie. He was a plumber. The opening bowler was Alan Connolly and he was a, a plumber. So I thought, oh, plumbing's not bad. If I took up being an electrician, I'd probably be dead, you know. You might make my mistake as an electrician and you're dead. As a, as a plumber, you just get wet. So just take a towel to work and you'll be right. <laughs> well, it was, it was a good choice there. <laughs> nice, nice. The next segment is called Winners and Losers, Sheets. 
Now, despite your incredible career as a player and coach uh, where you won the seven premierships, it wasn't always good times though. You coached the GWS Giants in their first ever season and you won three games in 44 of those games. Tough times there, but was it one of your toughest times in footy or do you look back and go, you know, I learned a lot from that experience? Well, it was one of the great times. I coached the Giants for two years in the NEFL and then two years in the AFL, their first two years. Uh, of the 44 games, you are correct, we won three. And of course, they were the youngest team ever to play AFL football in the history of time, you know, over 150 years. They were not expected to win. And I was taking that responsibility on board. And what I used to do is just divide the game into four one-point matches. So four half-hour matches for one premiership point per quarter. And that's how I ran it. So we ran a different ladder to uh, Vladimir Dimitri's ladder in the AFL. We had the Kevin Sheedy ladder of how to believe in yourself because I think maybe 14 of the players had never played a game in their first game or two. And if we rested three after two or three weeks because they were pretty tired, these kids, just remember, they're one year out of year 12. I don't know how you would have done it this year because, you know, most of the kids over here in Victoria only played five games in two years. Yeah. So we had the two – yeah, we had the two drafts and we're going to put them in the AFL. Well, well, good luck. So in the end, my job was to make sure we protected the health of the kids, get them to still believe their confidence uh, after they kept the hammering. Uh, we probably had a handful of uh, senior players that were probably retired, but we kept their careers alive, except for you know, Davis and Callum Ward, who are the captains. But, you know, when you when you look back on uh, five or six of the other boys, we got one or two out of retirement. We got in a rugby league player called Izzy Falau. Of course. We got, um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we did a lot of different things. But the main thing in there is we're building a club. And you nearly have to say from a West Sydney AFL club to get within – nearly two grand finals in the first seven years in AFL history is just one of the most unremarkable stories, remarkable stories, I should say, of all time in football history. They got to one, got belted, obviously. They missed one by a kick, which Footscray finally got up and won that premiership, the Bulldogs, with the Bulldogs. So it was an amazing way Mark Williams and I set that, uh, that club up, along with a lot of other people, obviously, and to keep the boys believing that they're going to have wonderful careers while they're getting smashed by 10 and 15 and 20 goals. And that was the secret of it. So we would give them 12 points in a quarter and we got within 12 points or three goals of some of the better sides. Well, I would give them one premiership point for that effort. So I never gave them ever, hardly ever four points, uh, unless I won them, obviously, in which we won the three games. But we could get beaten by 10 goals and we might have, say, given them two or three premiership points of that season. So at the end of the season, we might have finished with maybe 19 premiership points, but, you know, one win. It's a really good way of looking at it as well. And do you feel as though you mentioned before that success that the club's gone on to have with, um, you know, playing in finals, playing in a grand final, obviously the result didn't go the way they wanted to against the Tigers, but do you feel as though, you know, you had a fair bit to do with that with the way the first few years went and, and how you built the club? Oh, my, yeah, of course you do, because you build the foundation. I mean, we never had a ground to train on. We had parklands. We never had club rooms at all. We had a really hilarious hill, which is about 40 k's out, right out past Parramatta. So that was sort of um, the RSL, which are very, very good to us. And that's why I've always admired the RSL. They always help people in need, and we were in need of a club. We're out near Blacktown. We're not actually where we are now. We come back in after a couple of years and settle a place down. We went and bought a, um, a heat golf hitting range in and around the Olympic 2000 Olympic Stadium. Built that into a, uh, the, that golf clubhouse. We built that into uh, what is there today. Now all of this is going on while we're playing in the NEFL in the first two years of AFL. So we did an enormous amount. Now, just remember, they've got 33,000 members right now. Most NRL clubs in the city don't have 33,000 members in their <laughs> footy clubs. So we did an amazing job. All the staff there, Mark and I, were really a tandem coaching duo because I'd have, I was always out there trying to get money out of governments to help build these, um, well, ex extend the stadium, which is what is now called, you know, Giant Stadium, and previously it was called Spotless. 
So I think to myself, we did an enormous amount of work. We're very proud of what we did. Yeah, you certainly should be for sure, Shades. Moving on to our next segment, one of my favourites. This one's called Starstruck Celebrities. Now, there's no doubt you've met some very famous people along the way. Um, tell us the most famous person you ever met, though, and what their experience was like um, in terms of that meeting and why they were so, you know, they made such a, a difference in your life. The first person I, I actually met that I thought, wow, He's a very different person. Was I toured America for six or seven weeks? We won the '74 Premiership. I spent my money on going out and see buying some of these books and videos. I met Eugene Cern at NASA Space Control. He'd been to the moon, landed once, and went up and orbited another time in space. Now he was just an incredible person to speak to. Uh, a great learning lesson for me because he's extremely religious person because he, he just believed that that there was a God out there in space helping them get through all of that flight to the moon, land on the moon and come home. He said, look, I know not everybody believes in God, but I do. And when you've been out into the orbit of space twice, I thought, mate, this guy's an incredible person. And, of course, the other one's Muhammad Ali, who I'd always admired for standing up for his rights. And, and what, a, what an enormous athlete he was when he took on um, the world championship titles, got disqualified and come back and still won world titles. The next segment, Sheeds, is called Reminiscing on the Good and Bad Times. Now, looking back on your coaching and playing career, there's obviously not much you haven't done. What have been some of the highs and lows of your career and do you have any regrets at all? Probably the only regret I was thinking of in my life was that I never coached Richmond. That would have been pretty good if I had of. But look, things, contracts never often work out that way. And, and look, one year they wanted me to replace Kevin Bartlett, who's one of my best mates. So I thought, well, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to dub my best mate. <laughs> anyway, so that was probably the disappointing thing, as I didn't get the coach from the club I played for. It was a wonderful club and gave me a fantastic start in my footy. And obviously losing grand finals for the fans, you know, like um, one grand final we got beat by Carlton in 72. They, were, they kicked 28 goals, nine. And when you're in the back pocket, that's a hell of a lot of balls flying over your head. You know? <laughs> so I felt like I was in London when they were dropping bombs, you know. But anyway, that's another story. So that's the greatest score ever in a grand final at that stage. Uh, we made a really come, great comeback in the last half, but we couldn't catch them. Um, and, of course, the 1983 grand final was um, a debacle after really working hard for three years. The first three years of my coaching career, we got beaten by 13 goals. That was probably the worst debacle in my coaching career. Yeah, up against a pretty good Hawthorne team back in those days, though. Well, they were the best. They were fantastic. Absolutely, they were. Of course, they had great players from everywhere, you know. But in the next two years, we smashed them. So <laughs> they, got their, they got their pay in the end. And uh, this next segment, Sheeds, is called They Said What? Now, what? I mentioned your book before. I'll just uh, show it again. Icons of Sport. You've got it there in the background as well. Oh, yeah. Well, in my last two books, uh, the yeah. kids' book, which I bought out last year, Finding Your <laughs> uh, Idols and Chasing Your Man. Yeah, yeah, this next segment's called They Said What? So the book of Icons of Sport, you interview a number of different sports people um, from around the world. I guess uh, in terms of the book, though, who really surprised you and why? And, and, and the idea behind the book, where did it come from? Well, they're the people that over each decade of my life, I took a couple out of each decade. Well, when you're 74, there's a few decades, so there's a few people. They're not necessarily the greatest ever, but they're great stories of purpose, dedication, overcoming issues. I mean, you know, just thinking of Jessica Watson, I mean, the courage for that young girl to sail around the world at 16. Now, go to any local 16-year-old girl at a high school and have a look and go, how did, that, how did she ever do that? Because they're just they're young girls, you know. But to sail around the world is a remarkable story. The planet, to live it, uh, the loneliness. So I interviewed her in the book, Michelle Payne, having to try and get past all the men in the Melbourne Cup and get past all the men in the toilets and bloody saunas and, you know, putting up with male chauvinistic humour because we know what that's like. Women know what it's like, obviously. But to, to cope with all of that, after her mother died when she was a baby, her story is just incredible. When, and I interviewed her 
So I'm lucky to get these interviews, by the way. I didn't interview everybody because some are deceased, but it, it's just a marvellous book. So I love the challenge that these women and men have done in their life. I mean, I didn't realise when I was sitting there because I went to the, the Tour de France when Cadell Evans won it. And uh, so I went back and thought, mate, this guy. So I put all my bike cycling gear and, you know, I've been over the, the, the Tour Down Under with that in South Australia. I've, I've been to a lot of cycling. I loved cycling early when I was a kid. Obviously, you've got to give it up to play footy or you know, cricket and that. So, in the end, you know, Cadell Evans is born in Catherine. Catherine. Now, how do you get the Tour de France winner out of Catherine into another state, get on a bike, go to the Tour de France eight or nine times before and then finally win it at 35 when most AFL players are retiring? Yeah. That's an incredible story. Yeah, you're not wrong. And the Michelle Pay one, you mentioned that before as well. I loved her movie, uh, Ride Like a Girl. That was one of my favourite movies I've ever seen. Oh, well, it, well, it should be because, I mean, well, obviously it's true. And the actors in it did a marvellous um, part, particularly um, the, the father being such a sort of a – and it would be incredibly being left with, I think, 11 kids and your wife dies you, and you've got all these kids to worry about and still run a, a horse racing business. A, l- a lot of difficulties that families have. And I admire them. You know, I just admire them, you know. And, you know, when you, you, you people may not remember, you're probably too young to remember a guy called Young, you know. It's the last story in the book and um, Cliff Young. I remember Cliff Young, yeah. It was an iconic. Yeah. Yeah, well, well he, I mean, he ran in his 60s. He won the race and beat the professionals. That's a, a farmer. A farmer beat the professional marathon runners that were invited to, to run in this race. And they put Cliff in as probably a bit of, a bit of chowder that's going to get blown out of the water within the first few days. Well, he won the race. And the great story about that is that when, when they went to sleep, he kept running. Yeah, that's an unbelievable story. You're right. And it just gives anyone inspiration to, to know that in your 60s you can uh, beat anyone if, you, if you've got that desire. Well, but Dennis Pagan, I'll put him in, uh, you know, just a, a story, not about football. There's nothing, no football in this. This is all about other people, other sports. Yeah. But Dennis Pagan actually gets his license begrudgingly from the Victorian racing, you know, uh, people. And they said, well, we don't, we're not happy about this, basically. And Dennis is in it. I've interviewed Dennis because I know him. He was my assistant coach here for a while and won some wonderful premierships for North Melbourne. But here's this guy. He's the same age as me. So he wins a derby at 73. <laughs> now, that, that, <laughs> I've still got horse trainers on, though, because I breed horses and own the sire of Black Caviar, and our, our stand was a great stand, Bella Spree. But, you know, there will be thousands of trainers still envious of how Pagan's ever done that. That's an incredible story. It is. Yeah, Johnny get angry, and it was in this year's Melbourne Cup as well. So, <laughs> Well, yeah, the winner of this year's Melbourne Cup, right, come 10th last year, I think, yeah, you're right. So sometimes you got to get in there and have a win. Yeah, my word. <laughs> yeah, it ran down the track. It ran down the track. So you never win, Johnny. Don't, don't worry about Johnny getting angry. He might just went out there for a practice run this year. <laughs> yeah, that's just right. Just to build up. He's, well, he's only a four-year-old, so, you know, he, next year he might be five. He could win it at six. I mean, the great Bart Cummings that I put in the book, he, he won a Melbourne Cup with Rogan Josh, a 17-year-old, sorry, a seven-year-old horse, owned by a lady in Darwin, Trained by a trainer in Webster, Webster in West Australia, he said, look, Jack, I won't be able to do this. I think the horse has got a chance. Come and have a look at it. Bart Cummings takes over a horse called Rogan Josh. who well, hadn't done much. And he won some Melbourne Cup with it. I mean, the man is a freak. And if you talk about one comments that you re- remind people and remember when they talk to you, I asked Bart, what is one of the great schools you, you've got that no one really would appreciate it outside of racing like people like us. He said, well, I think observation is one of my really great skills. I said, observation. He said, how am I going to explain that to people? He said, well, that's quite easy, Sheets. He said, the horse can't talk. So I've got to observe it. I've got to feel and understand every movement. I've got to understand if he's sore, injured, done a hamstring. Oh, it's just, it was just an amazing lesson by me to listen to an incredible person like Bart. And that's what I put in the – I mean, these stories are 
look, really, I'm, what I'm actually doing in this book, I'm going out there chasing knowledge, bringing it into a book so the reader can really learn from other people, other Australian people that have done marvellously well. Not the greatest of all time, but they're people that inspired me in some way, shape or form. Can't wait to have a read, Sheeds. And uh, once again, I'll just show Icons of Sport, get it at all your usual book outlets. It's going to be a ripper. Uh, yeah, well, sure. uh, Dimmick's, a, Dimmick's a probably the big one in Adelaide, I imagine. They've always been a big supporter of my books. I've got uh, I've made a couple of mates of mine and bought four boxes just to give them to people as Christmas presents. What a, four what a, boxes. They're they own companies. What a great obviously. idea. So that, <laughs> well, they don't, well, they said, well, if we give them a bottle of wine, you know where that's going. <laughs> if, we give them a book, if we give them a book of knowledge, it's there forever. Yeah, great advice. Now, the next segment, Sheets, this one's called Comeback Kings. Now, as a super coach that you've been over a number of years, you produced a couple of huge comebacks. 93 with the, the Bombers, um, not many Crow supporters would like to remember that one, but uh, you were you're down by seven goals at half time and came back to, to win that and then obviously go on to the, the premiership there in 93. And um, in 2001, I was at that game, unbelievable game. The Bombers were down by 69 points in the second term and came back to beat the Roos. Now, both yeah. of those games, can you sort of give us a bit of an insight as a coach in terms of what you said to the players um, to get them to come back from such, you know, such big margins? I feel you've got to give belief to the players when they're sort of mentally annoyed and frustrated. There's no good yelling at players at half time or, you know, three quarter time. You know, you might every now and then do that, obviously, to try and shake their little mental capacity, their thinking at the present time. But but if we, at half time, you can know. You nearly know five minutes before half time what I'm going to do for that 10 minute block where I've got their total attention after they've been to the trainer, seen the doctor, da da da. So, and often I'll play the tape of what um, Debbie Flintoff, which is in the book, she, she won on the last step, she never gave up. So, I know on one of those two occasions, I played that tape and I'm I'm pretty sure, and only the tape only goes for not even a minute because Debbie Flintoff's race only goes for about that. But she was running six at the halfway mark and she won on the last step, which means you never, ever, ever give up. But in the Adelaide game, you, you've got to give a, a mathematical equation. If we kick two or three goals in the first 10 minutes, you've still got approximately 50 minutes to get a few more goals. And that's what we did mathematically up on the board. I mean, it, obviously it was Adelaide's first ever final, big final knockout final, this one. This you know, plenty of finals are hard sometimes in the grand finals. And our players believe that we could do that. And we had a marvellous, you know, Mark Harvey, Mark Thompson, you know, these players that I had, even Grenville, I mean, they're very good players, Gary O'Donnell, Michael Long. You know, they, they can rattle a cage and say, look, we're, we're still in this game if we get those two or three goals early, which we did. So all of a sudden it might be, you know, three and a half goals down 15 minutes into the third quarter, which it was. And so you've got now 45 minutes to win the game. And by the time we got there, three-quarter time, and Jarman missed a very crucial goal just before that three-quarter time siren, which helped, thank God. And that, that gave us a belief that there's a half-hour of opportunity here, which becomes a half-hour grand final ticket. But whatever happens... We're going to make it a close game in the last five minutes because that's the spirit of this club and that's what we are built on. Anyway, so and we were able to do that. We were able to do that. Before I let you go, Sheeds, my producer Rory's just come up with a question to ask you about. Um, what do you think of the famous Inches Al Pacino speech in any given Sunday? Did you draw any inspiration right. from that um, yeah. in your own coaching? Well, I used to, uh, before that, because before that ever come out, uh, to me it was always about the hand over the ball first. So to me it was about where your hand is that stops your opponent getting the ball. And you can do that very well with good body work and even in the air. Whilst you might be able to jump in the air, the person's jumped early and he's got, he's, he thinks he's got you. But if you can get your hand in front of his hand just to not mark that ball, then your hand controls the destiny of the game. So I always said hands. See, when you go to some of the football clubs in the old days, you know, the away rooms were terrible. So I made them like Hollywood. <laughs> I had my own printing I had my own printing press coming, you know, like the guy could say to you right now, I could say, you know, those books, that's only wallpaper. You just don't know that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no. So I yeah. 
But I could say that people say, oh, is it really that wallpaper? Yeah, just 60 bucks. And this looks interesting. It looks like I'm very smart. They've got a lot of knowledge, but really, I'm obviously they're books. But you can do that. And all I do is just the, the old printing um, Herald, Herald papers and, you know, the Adelaide Advertiser, where they put them in the little sort of steel cage outside the news agencies. I had all of them. I had my own printing press and I changed the whole room into the most positive room you can be, ever be involved in. And even earlier days before anybody ever thought of putting the ground on the on the floor in the game day, I had tape put on the floors as if it were playing at the MCG and a special little box there for the grandstand called the grandstand or whatever ground we're at. Could be the MCG, could be Waverley, wouldn't matter. You know, it could be Essendon, Windy Hill, doesn't matter. But there'll be a little box here. There's the grandstand. That's where we're at. This is where the wind's blowing and this is where we're going to attack. So we actually had a running movie on the floor plan of the actual floor of that club room's away team. But if you want to, when you're going to be a little bit ahead of the times, you know, I was doing a Zoom for company and they said, what would you do now if you were coaching Kevin? I said, I have my own commando force. I'd have my own squadron and that would be my drone squadron. I had drones sitting over every club watching training and watching what they're doing. <laughs> and they just, they just packed up laughing. <laughs> packed up laughing. They couldn't believe you'd even think of that. I said, well, they used drones the other week looking for that little girl lost over in Western Australia, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. Make the so most of the cool. technology for sure. Uh, there's so much technology out there that you could use now, but... I'm just making people alert that, you know, people even my age are still very with it, switched on, and just because you're not coaching doesn't mean you can't coach. Just that I had my belly full and I just want to have a, a wonderful last quarter of my life <laughs> by sending out writing books of all the ways you can learn about uh, how to better yourself, how to get through life, overcome the difficulties and move on because um, our country's been through a number of wars and we are the very lucky recipients of what our defence forces have done so we can have the life that we've got here in the wonderful island of Australia. So when I hear whinges, mate, I'm, I go after them. Oh, yeah. You know, no, well, really, well said. Think, yeah. like, so, Couldn't agree with you more, mate, on that one. <laughs> well, Kevin Cheedy, what an absolute pleasure to have you on Legends with Bebo today. Thank you so much for your time. The book, again, is called Icons of Sport. Do yourself a favour and go out and buy that one. And we'll look forward to speaking again down the track with you, mate. Not a problem. See you later, boys.